I'm going to show you now uh, something about the HR diagram and that stands for Hertzsprung Russell diagram. This is a great way to show how stars are actually um, not necessarily working, but it tells us something about uh, what we see uh, with stars all over uh, the universe when we look out. Because not all stars have the same uh, brightness, not all stars have the same color. So we have this really nice diagram uh, that we can actually use to plot what we see. So, um, on the y-axis, we either have luminosity, so in other words, some sort of absolute intrinsic, you know, that's how, how powerful the star is. We might also have, instead of luminosity, we might actually plot um, absolute magnitude instead, because that's something similar to that, although it's a different scale, but it's a similar idea. So basically what this is plotting on the y-axis is some sort of intrinsic property of a star, so how bright it really is. Because remember, a star could be really bright, but be really, really far away, so it'll appear dim. So we don't care how it appears, we care what the star is really doing. So in this case, this is some sort of uh, a plot of how bright stars really are in real life. If you could you know, be close to it, it'd be extra bright, then it would be higher up here. Now you're supposed to know about this diagram, you're supposed to know what uh, things can be on the scale. So on the x-axis here we might have what's called spectral class, or we might also have temperature in Kelvin. So when I say spectral class, uh, this is again another weird uh, historical astronomy thing, but they have different classes of stars. And so, uh, for example, the ones over here, they're called O stars, and then there's B stars, and then there's A stars, and then there's F, then there's G, then there's K, and there's M. There's even some other kinds that they've added, but uh, that's not so important. Now, I would say uh, this is, again, a little bit historic, and it's kind of, well, you have to learn that, uh, you have, at least on a test, you're expected to know these in order. So you're supposed to know that it goes O, B, A, F, G, K, M. So you're supposed to know this. There's a nice easy mnemonic to remember it. Uh, keep in mind, this was uh, invented by astronomers who at the time, at least, they were mostly female, uh, mostly male, sorry. So maybe they're a bit sexist. So the, um, the mnemonic, at least, that I was taught was Oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. It's a bit lame. Um, I actually invited my students to come up with a better one. And there was one girl actually who thought of a really good one. Hers was, oh, be a feminist, go kill men. Well, maybe that's not as nice either, but whatever works, as long as you can remember, O-B-A-F-G-K-M. Um, now these are also associated with temperatures. Uh, that means, remember what we learned from uh, black bodies, temperature also means color. So something over here, for example, this is cooler, this is hotter. Now how hot? This could be 30,000 Kelvin, for example, on this side of the scale here. Um, I know that a G star, not just a genes company, um, is around 5,000 Kelvin. I know that because our star is actually considered a G star. That's kind of neat. Uh, so, as far as how these look, these right here look more red. These ones over here look more yellow. And over here, these more look sort of, these look more uh, white or blue. So if you look up in the sky and you were able to see a red looking star, you could say, oh, that star is cooler. It's not as warm. Um, our star, for example, our sun is known as a G star. It appears yellow um, and it has an associated uh, effective temperature of about 5,000 Kelvin. In other words, it behaves like a black body at 5,000 degrees Kelvin. Now what happens then is we can plot how stars, uh, you know, if you look at most of the different stars that we can see around, those stars are all going to be in our own galaxy because we can only see stars um, that are quite close. 
as they get further and further away, even a really bright star is going to seem so dim you can't even see it. So then we need to look at galaxies or special things like stars that are exploding. Only those are bright enough for us to see them. But when we look at stars in our own neighborhood, in our own galaxy, we see that a lot of them seem to lie along this weird line here. So you're supposed to know something about this line right here. So what this means is that uh, this is called the main sequence. This is where most stars, uh, well, where stars spend most of their lives. So this is when they convert hydrogen to helium. So this is when they're happily just burning away. They've got hydrogen in their core and they're converting it. You know, it's a nuclear fusion reactor. They're constantly converting hydrogen to helium, gives off lots of light. Hydrogen to helium gives off lots of light. And stars spend the vast majority of their life in the main sequence. That's why we call it main sequence. Now keep in mind, different stars, I mean, they come in different shapes and sizes and varieties. So for example, you might have a cooler star, but that also tells you it's not going to be very luminous, right? It's going to be pretty dim. Whereas a star that's uh, very hot here, it's going to be very bright. And it turns out, hot stars, very bright ones here, are also very massive. So it also tells you something about their mass, you know, how much, how many kilograms they have in them. So these very massive stars actually don't live very long. It's kind of funny, they just sort of totally burn themselves out. They're super bright, right? They're very luminous. They appear, they're very, very hot, and they die really fast. But these are actually the exciting ones. These ones are the ones that might make black holes or really weird things. Uh, stars down here are a little bit more boring. In fact, the ones over here, they live for so long. Uh, some of these at least are expected to, you know, live es essentially forever. They're going to be billions and billions of years, their lifetimes. Whereas ones over here might be only millions of years. So in other words, they might actually, some of them uh, might actually be younger than the Earth is. So this also tells you something about lifetime of a star. But so our star, for example, sits uh, right around here. It's the sun. Uh, when I say main sequence, I mean, you know, that's this, this whole section here. I just didn't want to point main sequence to the sun. This whole area is called main sequence. So our sun is a yellow star and it's sitting happily in the main sequence at the moment, which means it's mainly burning hydrogen to helium. There it goes. At some point though, it's uh, going to stop uh, having enough hydrogen. Uh, what we call this, this is something we call hydrostatic equilibrium. This is something you are supposed to know a little bit about. And what this means is um, there's a constant battle between inwards force of gravity and the outwards uh, radiation pressure. Because, I mean, there's lots of fusion going on inside. There's lots of energy being emitted outwards. There's like a constant battle outwards of radiation pressure and inwards is gravity. So if a star is stable and happy, it's going to be sitting what we call hydrostatic equilibrium. It's sitting happily like this. Now what happens though is that as it burns up more and more hydrogen, in other words, as there's less hydrogen remaining, then it's not going to be able to burn enough in order to have enough pressure. What happens then naturally is that, well, there's not enough outwards pressure, there's still lots of mass, so it's going to contract. Now it has less mass, but it's a really weird thing. It's actually going to contract and then it gets hot enough, then it can start burning heavier things like helium to other things. And so that's sort of the process with stars. But what most stars do though, is like the sun, for example, it's going to end up following this weird shape. We don't have to know the exact shape uh, in uh, astrophysics for high school here, thankfully. I've taken some courses on this and it's really complex what happens. It sort of takes these weird dips and things and these ones over here do different shapes. But the end result is they're going to end up somewhere up here as a red giant. So over here, they're going to be very red, which means they're cooler, but they're actually going to be very, very big. So even uh, our sun, for example, is expected to where even it's uh, as it sort of dies out, it's going to as it has less and less hydrogen in its core, it's actually going to go up, migrate up to red giant. We don't think our sun has enough mass to do much exciting. So at that point, it's going to become what we call a planetary nebula. It's going to start shedding off its uh, different layers of gases. It's probably going to look really pretty to people watching. Um, 
But what's going to happen then is, of course, it's going to shed off those things, and eventually there's going to be not much left. In other words, it's going to go down and become a sad little thing over here called a white dwarf. Okay, so these, these are basically like the, the cores of dead stars, or stars at least that are dying. There's not much left to them, and it's thought that then those white dwarfs basically just uh, stop emitting light and eventually just kind of, they sizzle out. They still exist, they're just going to be dark things and we won't be able to see them, that's all. So this is what the Hertzsprung diagram uh, tells us, okay, the HR diagram. It tells us where the main sequence is. Most stars spend most of their lives uh, right here, the vast majority of their lives here. And then they end up usually going up to red giant. If a star is uh, not much mass like our own, it's going to end up you know, shedding off some layers and eventually coming down to be a, a little white dwarf. And then it's dwarf because it's actually a lot smaller. However, if it's a big massive star, it might go into the red giant phase and then do some really exciting things um, and then actually end up blowing up in a supernova. Then it can actually make a neutron star in the core or if it has even enough mass, it can make a black hole. So that's why really massive stars, they might go to red giant and then to something else. Whereas stars like our sun go up here to red giant and then sort of die out in the white dwarf stage.